Bobish. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here at Bob Conference. Give another talk. <clears throat> so I've been programming Haskell for a long time. Um, now I get paid for it. <laughs> and uh, I was a mathematician. So I tend to approach Haskell as, as a mathematician would. So I, I see these abstract data types and mathematical, mathematical structures like monoids. And I really appreciate how Haskell can uh, I can express them in code. That if I just choose the right structures and put them together, then I get the program that I want. Um, but now I get paid to work in Haskell. And in the commercial world, there seems to be this dichotomy of, uh, well, mathematics and academia on one side, and on the other side, there's code that is supposed to be practical, that works in production. Um, I believe that this dichotomy is false. Uh, I believe that the code that is pleasing from a mathematical point of view is also the code that you want to run in production. And today, I would like to make this point by giving, presenting to you an example. So, I'm part of a team that uh, writes a wallet software for blockchain called Cardano. Uh, some users use it to transfer millions of dollars. And so this thing is definitely in production. And, uh, but it's also, also a bit unwieldy, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a large code base. It's a bit unwieldy, and by using uh, some ideas for, from mathematics, we have been able, or are in the process of restructuring it so, to be, so that it becomes much easier to maintain, and perhaps then introduce new features. And specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, data encodings and how they allowed us to separate uh, something I would call business logic from database uh, operations. Um, all right, I'm going to present to you code in the wild and uh, how how we changed it. Okay, so here, this is our code in the wild. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, a friendly way of calling it. This, this is a uh, Monolith. Um, so everything is, is, is a total max, and what we actually want is uh, this much cleaner picture where we have a clear separation of concerns. So the, the thing on the, the white thing on the left on, on the right is uh, mostly concerned about being white, and the thing on the left is mostly concerned about being red. Internally, they can still be a mask, but the point is that the communication between them is very clear and delineated. And that is something we managed to do here. So that is kind of that was the generic talk. Every talk could begin about programming could begin like this. Now we come into the specifics about specifics the specific concerns that we can separate. Um, so here is a concern. Um, let's call it business logic. Uh, let's keep it very simple. So I have a set, a data type, a set of things, a set of T's. And I have two operations on them. One is I list all the things in the set. Um, so it takes this data type and returns a list of the things that are in it. And then I, t uh, I also consider a second operation that's called it filter, uh, which takes a set of things and removes some of them according to some criterion, which I will talk about later. So just extremely uh, simple. And the other, co the other concern uh, we have is um, Operations on a database. So this would be about tables and rows inside the tables, and it has columns. And one way to model this is, is the following interface, for example. So we can uh, load a set from, from the database. And uh, here, this is no longer a pure function. This is an I, uh, I O action. And the other operation would be write. So we take a set, and we write it set of things, and we somehow map it to a, a database table. And a good, uh, um, good signature for that would be, oh, we take a, take a set and return an IO action that simply does that. Um, and the problem, well, that this works. This is a good separation of concerns. If you can do that, do this. <laughs> um, and the problem is that if the set, set of things becomes very large, then writing the entirety of the set to the database is, is very slow, because you have to write everything. And so in some cases, and our software was one of them, um, we actually want, we want to update the database. So we have one row in the database that we want to update. 
But if we see this database as, as a set of things, then um, this right, right thing is not, not enough. So we need some kind of update operation. And this is essentially the, the uh, pivoting point, point of what I want to talk about today. And this is where the data encodings come in. Okay, so before, before I tell you about the typing signature of, of the update, what this is supposed to be, let me tell you uh, a little bit more about what I want to do specifically. So this is about submitting transactions to a blockchain. So a, chain, a blockchain is a chain of blocks. Uh, it stores, <laughs> it stores uh, information about who owns what kind of uh, stuff, typically money made up for magic internet money. And if you want to transfer money from one owner to another owner, you have to send a transaction uh, to, to the network, which stores this, this, this stores and processes this blockchain. And um, some of the transactions may go into a block, and then they become a new, new source of truth for who owns which kind of magic internet money. And uh, it may also happen that some transactions just don't make it. They are forgotten about. It's, it's not very common, but you need to keep tra track of this corner case. So it can happen that a transaction expires. Um, so, and so this is uh, the business logic in this case uh, is about keeping track of transactions, some of which have expired. So it seems very, very simple. Uh, and this would be the interface. So we have a set of transactions, TX. We have two functions listing all the transactions that are currently in submission and expire, uh, remove all those that have expired. Our monolith <laughs> is, is called Cardano Wallet. It's open source. So on GitHub, it has 350 Haskell files, 150,000 lines of code. Of, of those, a third are test cases. And here's, here's one example. <laughs> Uh, uh, of the, this is this is code that was in master and in the master branch at one point in time. So this uh, this makes us all those concerns. It's hard to understand as a whole. So let me focus on a few particular things. So it lists something. Uh, it's an I/O action. It uh, calls SQL more or less directly, and uh, it uh, specifically it uh, this is a SQL select operation from a database. So this is mixing these concerns very, very heavily. So you kind of the, the business logic of, oh, I have these transactions and I want to list them is very much intermingled with the database where they're stored. And same thing for expired. So this is the original uh, definition of expired. There was a master at some point. And the, the highlights are, um, it's still an IO action. Um, it's on a raw SQL statement. Now it uses something, a, a function called update where from a library called persist. So there's some uh, weirdness as far as the level of abstraction goes. So this is now not SQL, okay. And um, mm -hmm. it takes all the things that have expired and uh, updates them. But there's, there's a good reason why, why, why the code probably evolved in this way, so this was before for my time. Um, and the reason is that if we had load and write, uh, then this would not be enough to write this particular function, because it, uh, it somehow relies on this notion of update. I have a, list, a set of transactions, and I want to update just a few of them, and updating all of them at once on a database would be expensive. So we need something a little more, which allows us to, to separate these concerns better. And, and the point is, in order to have this update where it's not enough to, to, uh, to change the database, we need some support from the business logic. So this function expired takes the original set, and instead of returning the new set of transactions, it needs to re return some sort of uh, description of what changed from the new set the all set. So this, um, and this is where these data encodings come in. So I, uh, the, the expire function now doesn't return a set, but a uh, change or a difference, a delta from one set to the other. And then update can, can take this, uh, this change and apply it 
to the database. So that's one of the key points we have. We, we don't have to make the business or, or, or do I.O. and the business logic itself, but we do, have, we do need some support from it. All right, and this support comes in the form of what I like to call data and colleagues. And I would like to give you a brief introduction to that, or how I see it. Okay, so here's, yeah, let's take a type of set of A's, the A's here are in red, and uh, I want to define a type called data set one. Uh, it's, an, it's a disjoint union, it has two constructors, the one is I can either insert an element to, to a set, or I can de delete an element from a set, and I can take this data and apply it to an actual set. In this case, it's very simple, I just call out to these functions that already exist, so I don't have to really implement this. I, I, I take the insert and the delete functions, and that's it. So in a sense, this, this data set one is a very small subset of all the functions that are available on sets. And I can put this pattern into a type class. So let's call this type class data. Uh, DA here is this uh, instance would be this data set one. It has a base. This is the type that the data is operated on. And then this apply function, which takes the data and turns it in, into an actual change. So this would be the one instance uh, for this. So we have. Uh, you mean base of DA? Yes, I do. I'm sorry. Yes, so this should, should this should be base of DA. Right, A is not even in scope here. Um, all right, so so this would this would be the uh, an implementation. Uh, the, the base type of this data is, is the type of sets, and we insert and delete stuff with this apply function. And the nice thing about structuring it in a type class such as this is um, we we can define more data types using existing ones. Uh, for instance, here is the, a, a data set type that I actually want to use. It's a list of data set one. So data set one acted, uh, took a single element and inserted it into the set or deleted it from the set. Here I take many elements, so it's a list of changes, and I apply them to the data. And this is also one, uh, one key idea here is that uh, both of these data types have the same base. They both operate on sets, but they're distinct data types. Um, I mean, this, this stuff is not new. Uh, people often rediscover this, um, but they usually do it the other way around. They, they say, oh, I have a base type, and I, I have a single data type to that. Uh, I suggest to do it the other way around. And that is, uh, uh, that is inspired by mathematics, actually. So there's a theory of vector bundles where this is the right way of doing it. Um, uh, but that would be <laughs> that would be too far here. So here's one instance we, we can now write. Given a data type uh, DA, we can the list of DAs is also something that we can apply. So the base type is exactly the same. And if we want to apply a list, we fold over this list of data. Um, we use a fold R here, and the reason is that we then get this law. Uh, if we have a list of data and Y S is the end. Or the second part of the list, and X S is the, the head near the head of the list, and the rear of the list is applied first, and the head of the list is applied last. So application goes from right to left here. Um, this is the, the conventions naturally lead to this. If I want to this equation to hold in this way with X is to the left and Y is to the right, then that is are applied from right to left. All right, so and here, here's, here's one, one example of how you would actually use this. So here's the definition of the expire function. Uh, now we have a criterion, we have a certain time. We take the set of the x, and we want to delete all this stuff which has expired. So we have a predicate here, a transaction x is expired. Well, if its expiry date uh, is before, before now, and then we take the list of transactions and return a data uh, for each element that we want to delete. So we return this delete y, 
is an element of delta set one, and the whole list is then an element of delta set, and that is the delta region. So how, this is how you would uh, work this out in practice, and that is that's like what we did. Um, I did promise a little bit of mathematics, <laughs> which I, I'm going to squeeze in here. Um, uh, this subclass and, and, and these de de delta types or delta encodings, they have this nice property that they form an interesting uh, category. So uh, the usual category of Haskell types and functions between them is, well, the types are the type, the objects, and the morphisms, those are functions between types. So morphism from A to B is as a function. For the delta types, the morphisms are more interesting. So um, a mapping between delta types means that we have a mapping uh, from one base type to another base type. This would be this fairly ordinary function f here. But then you also have sort of a derivative uh, of uh, that, that matches with this function. So this this function. This derivative takes an element of the base type, it takes a delta, and return, computes a new delta that acts on the, uh, on the beats. And the idea is that this diagram on the left should commute. So if I apply a delta first, and I map with my function f to the blue stuff, then this should be the same if I first map from the red to the blue stuff, and from the blue stuff I use this computed delta for the blue stuff. So somehow it's about mapping deltas from, for red stuff to deltas for blue stuff. And um, that is an interesting category which I will <laughs> um, not say much more about here. Alright, so this this was this was about the data encodings. Now for for the other side the, the database. Um, so here's what we wanted to do. We had these two concerns, business logic, database operations. We talked about uh, the need for deltas, and now how we deal with these database operations. So we have this set of three functions, load, write, and update. And now we package them up in a single data type. So let's we define a store as a facility for storing one value of type uh, base data. So this store is essentially just a record packaging up all those three things. A load operation, it returns a value of the space. A write operation takes a value from the base and puts it into the store. An update takes the data and uh, applies it directly to the store. And the store is parameterized by some monad and by, by this, this data type. And this packaging up in this way uh, it's very useful. So one, one example would be that delta is this delta set, and the base would be the set of transactions. And it, it, this thing has two, or it captures two, two very useful ideas. One is that if you have something, make it a first class volume. So now it's a store, and I can take, if I have different stores implemented I, in my code, I can combine them to get a, sto to get a store for a larger thing. Uh, and the second thing is that um, give it a type. So the store, it stores a single volume. In this case, the volume is, is a very complex thing. It's a set of stuff. But it's a single volume. It has a type set of transactions. And we put it, and then this is the thing that is being stored. So it stores a volume. It doesn't store it in memory, because then we wouldn't need to use the store. So it stores it on disk, or some halfway in between, or something like that. But the important thing, it's an ordinary Haskell value, it has a type, and that's all this store thing does. And that was an extremely useful uh, thing. And it's also extremely uh, easy to test, for instance. So we have this store somewhere in the database, and um, we write something to the database, and we apply change to the database, we apply another change to the database, and then we load from the database, and now the question is, what? what uh, was this all consistent, or is the state database still in a useful, useful state? And the answer is, well, we can test it. We can, just, we can take this pure volume, and in, in, there was a memory, and we can apply the first data to it, and then we can apply the second data, and then we simply check whether the store did the same thing. You see, the concern of the store was just storing the volume in a different way. 
It was not about doing something else with the body. And yeah, that's a very, this is how we do most, most of the unit tests, actually. And then we also get choices. So we can say, OK, uh, the, the red parts, they are clearly in memory implementations. And now they are the unit tests for the gray stuff, which we use in production. Or if we put, uh, uh, say, OK, in, in, in production, we actually want to be in memory, then the red stuff is the real implementation that goes into production. And the uh, uh, gray stuff, well, this is now the unit test. All right, so here's, uh, here's the current state of, of our mess. <laughs> of our mess. So we, we did this for, uh, right now, for, for submitted transactions, for funds that are in the wallet, for addresses, and the transaction history. And so for the submitted transactions, the funds and addresses, we now have a type. We have a Haskell type for that stuff. It's no longer opaque somewhere distributed in this database file. It now has a proper Haskell type. Um, and so this, this parameter x, this is about the addresses, the checkpoints, they're about the funds, and the submissions thing, well, this is the thing that I, uh, I tried to explain with these transactions that are in submission. And here is the type signature for one of our stores. So this is a store, it has a couple of uh, type parameters. S is related to how we store addresses in the database file. And then the monad, well, it's a bit fancier than the I.O. And the, the last argument here, uh, this is a data type for the wallet state itself. And here we compose it with a data type for, for maps, for the data dot map. And this runs in product. And the second thing that uh, we have something similar for the transaction history, um, there it's a little bit more complicated. I can't show any code, but I can show what what kind of trade-offs we can do. So we can say with a single line change, we can say, oh, we want to have the transaction history in memory. And then listing all transactions is fast, but takes a lot of memory. Or we can say, mm, no, let's do the other thing instead and move them all to disk. And then listing all of them takes a lot more time, but it also uses one gigabyte less uh, of memory. All right. So. This is what I wanted to demonstrate today. And the separation of concerns here, for our example, the business logic and database operation. And ideas that we needed on the business logic side were, uh, was that it needs to have some support for efficient updates. And we can use uh, this type class data, and these data encodings to, to model them. And one idea with that type class is that it's useful to have uh, to, from the, the, to have many data for a single base type. So if you try to do that, uh, do it this way. And the other one is um, on the database side, we have this idea of a store that stores a single Haskell value of a single type. Questions? Yes. This very much reminds me of what I heard earlier next door. Uh, when the talk was about um, differentiable functions. There you had a few functions that also knew how to compute its derivative. And here you have a pure function that mutates pure data, but you also keep track of how to um, mutate the data in the database. Yes. So I, I think there's a pattern here, but I don't know whether you want to see it that way. You mean this this pattern? Yeah. So um, essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're you're having a functor, right? So you have a functor from storable Haskell values and functions to um, dates, database states and database operations. Yeah. Well, so so first, um, it's true. <laughs> there's there, there's some truth to it. The, the details. Uh, are different. Um, uh, one remark is that, uh, that this stuff is no longer concerned with databases. So we, we do apply these data, we can apply them to databases, but when discussing data, databases have no longer any relevance. That is one of the key points. And the second key point is that 
Um, there's a thing called automatic differenti differentiation, which you probably heard uh, in the other time, is that indeed then you have an, a function between real numbers, and you want to keep track of its derivatives as well. And there, a, a, a similar pattern does, the, does show up. Um, this is slightly, um, not sure if it helps, but for physicists, <laughs> I would say, okay, so this, one of them, the automatic differentiation is about the tangent bundle, and this stuff is slightly more general in that it, you could say it's about vector bundles. And here is the idea that there is no unique notion of what is the derivative of a function. It, it depends on, on the data, or on this type of data you can have. So there are many options for what a difference or differentiation means in this case. But Uh, so when you work with blockchains, you probably have distributed systems at some point. And uh, did you ever come across uh, CRDTs or conflict-free replicated data types? Uh, do they uh, is that similar, or how does it relate? Um, what was the name of the data type CRDT? CRDT, conflict-free replicated data types. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't come across them. One thing that you can can say is that, oh, in one way, uh, or one, one way you can think is that each block of the blockchain, um, can, so you have a set of funds, uh, a, a block in the blockchain will change the ownership of the funds, so you can map each block that is coming into, uh, or that you receive from the blockchain to a set of changes, and uh, sometimes you have to roll back, so you can't go forward all the way, you have to go back a bit, and then this would be uh, equivalent to undoing this, this set of change. But maybe let's talk about it after that. Are there more questions? Uh, you mentioned a mathematical theory this is related to vector bundles? Yes, well it's could more than that. Could you briefly elaborate on what that is and how it relates? That is a good. Um, let me see if the categories help me there. Um, yeah. So the first from the theory of vector bundles. Um, the first notion is probably the notion of a tangent bundle. So imagine you are driving a car, and you are a certain point uh, in, in, your, in your plane where you're driving, and you have a velocity. And um, the notion of a tangent bundle is this idea of you have an arbitrarily curved surface, and giving an answer to what is your velocity at any point. Um, you see, if, if, if you are on a, on a map, you can take your present position, you're slightly in the future position and take the difference of that because you have these coordinates. But if you imagine, say, the sphere, the entirety of the Earth, uh, then it's not, uh, you can't take points on the Earth and, and subtract them. It's, it's more difficult. And this is where the notion of, of a tangent bundle comes in. And the notion of a vector bundle is um, a generalization of that. So for example, on the sphere, um, you have this, uh, on the sphere you can think of, to each point of the, of the sphere you have a collection of vectors uh, glued to it, or attached to it, this is, and the whole thing is this bundle of, of tangent vectors, so you can think of the tangent, tangent plane of the sphere, and all the vectors that live in there, and the whole thing would be the tangent bundle, and then there's also something called the normal bundle, which is at each point of the sphere, you take the vector in three-dimensional space now, which points directly outward from the sphere. And that would also be a, a bundle of, of vectors. In both cases, somehow this um, tangent bundle, um, if you think of the sphere as your base type, and these vectors of changes that you make to volumes uh, on the sphere, um, uh, then depending on what kind of changes you have, you, you use one vector bundle or the other vector bundle. And in both cases, somehow, there is a natural map from 
a point and the vector attached to it uh, to just the points. So if you take this, this collect this field and the tangent planes to it and forget about all the tangent planes and you get this field. And this is very much similar to this to this type family. It's how you um, embed uh, a type into the type of its endomorphism. Mm, not its endomorphisms, but it's, uh, the endomorphisms of another type. In this case, the base, base type. Yes, there was another question. Uh, well, but in this case, there's a geometry work, right? So in Basel structure should be somewhat. So in this case, there is no geometry involved, right? So we are, yes, no. we are just taking inspiration. So in this case, these are essential trivial bundle structures. We're just going to be a jack product, and the fibers are just going to be in of projection, right? So uh, how far can we push this analogy? Is it useful beyond the point? But do you have any non-trivial bundle structure? Uh, so it's in this context? No, no, I don't. I don't think this analogy can be pushed too far. I think it can be pushed far enough to make uh, this idea plausible. You take one base type and many data types on it. Th this is what I, <laughs> I may have taken it too far by mentioning vector bundles. <laughs> if there are any questions, not about vector bundles. <laughs> <laughs> So the data sets, they go from one value, and I guess there's some, sometimes you have an element of the data set, like delete x, it doesn't make sense for a value, maybe the value doesn't have x. And did that at one point bother you, try to make, did you try to make it type safe so that it's, you have a, basically, I guess, a different type at each point, and in this, did you experiment with that like as an independently type programming language, so you could actually express that? Um, and is dependently programming the same as vector bundles? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I didn't say no questions about vector bundles. <laughs> I, I have to admit that on the train from Leipzig to Germany and uh, from Leipzig to Berlin, I was now reading about homotopy type theory because <laughs> precisely to answer, maybe answer this question. <laughs> uh, so, yes. Um, if you want to be really precise, then you may want to use dependently type languages in the sense that you have a delta and it applies to a given value. So somehow in the type of the delta you want to make uh, sure that it's a single value that you apply to. Um, in the case of Haskell, it's, it, it's always a matter of practicality versus uh, uh, type safety versus usability. Uh, in this case, I'm not actually entirely sure of myself, but this served for the moment um, that um, we don't use dependent types. If a data doesn't apply to this value for some reason, then this, this function here is the identity function. So another design choice might have been to uh, take the base type and turn a maybe base type. If the data, say we have a set and we delete something which is not actually in the set, then it would be fair to return nothing here. But um, in order to, to, for instance, for these unit tests, it, it's a bit more convenient to always get uh, a body of the type out there. But you're right, this is, uh, there's some design space there which I didn't begin to explore yet. So about the spectrum bundle, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Something completely different. No, I still remember when I learned Haskell, like, I don't know, 2011 or so, in real world Haskell, there was a chapter on uh, map, just data.map. And it mentioned there is a up and coming library called Delta Map or something like that, but it doesn't perform well, and therefore it's you know a future thing that people are still working on. So the idea basically was, you know, basically what you just discussed. And now you're telling us that this is running in production, and I'm wondering, were there any breakthroughs, or how did that change from basically this real world Haskell comment about you know this is just not feasible? Um, yeah. I don't know, it depends, I suppose it depends on what you want to use it for. I mean, it's running in production, uh, <laughs> therefore it must be good. <laughs> um, no, um, I don't know what the comment was about. Perhaps some even more efficient uh, implementation. So, defining the data types by hand worked for us. That, that's... <laughs> 
Um, continuing from the question that Joachim asked, um, so maybe instead of dependent types, you could have some guarantees. Like uh, if we continue with this uh, delete uh, example, you could have um, a delete operation that um, deletes an element from a non-empty set, and then after that, the set may be empty. So you're not having base A to base A, but something different, and then um, this delta starts looking like uh, a category. Yes, that would be one point in the design of the space. Okay, so um, about these vector bundles, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something completely different. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, there was, was this idea of separation of concerns. So mm -hmm. this was like, okay, let's take all this database stuff and take it off to business logic. And I mean, in practice, it's often more like, okay, let's we have this business logic, and now we start a transaction, and now we do all this crazy database stuff. And when the transaction is through, all our business logic stuff is also happening. So um, my question would be, if you separate all this business logic stuff, which has to happen in memory, so you have like one state of your system and you apply all this business logic stuff and then you get all your data sets, and then at some point you have to apply them to your database, um, how do you handle like split brain issues where like your state of your system in memory doesn't no longer match the actual database state? So that, this is a problem that in Haskell does not appear, since it's a purely functional programming language. Um, in memory, I have, I have the old state and I have the new state, and I can choose which one to use at any point in time. And the points in time, they are mostly um, observed by this I.O. monarch. So when I, when I call an I.O. action and I want the state, whether it's new or the old one, um, I can choose at that point. Um, so typically what, what, what happens is that we call this update function and after that we look uh, at, the very, uh, at the mutable variable that holds the state. And so it is, there is an idea which I didn't talk about in this talk. Uh, uh, I called it db var. Um, it's like an m var or a mutable variable. If you put something into it, it will automatically be written to disk. And there's an implementation for that, and, and this would take care of this, this concurrency question, for example. I'm wondering how um, these delta encodings map to database operations in the end. Because, so SQL initially is a declarative programming language, and you're converting that to imperative operation, which hypothetically sort of increases the number of operations substantially and, you know, discards what the database engine might do instead, um, sort of, you know, it, it will try to optimize the query somehow, you're sort of throwing that away. And sort of as a second part of that question, like how does, it, how does the mapping happen? Have you measured the performance impact of doing this compared to using SQL service? Okay, perhaps on the second part, I'm happy if the code looks somewhat manageable. <laughs> uh, uh, on the first part, um, so it's more about the structure of the code than of the performance. On the first question, um, one way to, to, to rephrase it is to say that, um, so. SQL does offer a couple of verbs for changing database. Those verbs are inserting a row, or deleting a row, or updating a row. And uh, if I come with my own data, data types, then uh, the intention of these data encodings is that these are for more complicated. These are for compound types, uh, which exist in Haskell, but which have no direct uh, representation in database tables. You see, if I'm using SQL, I'm confined to the to the data types that SQL gives me, those are tables. And so what, if I can express something as an insertion or deletion of rows, then, then certainly that helps me. But uh, as, we, as we progress in abstraction, at some point, 
And we have things like this wallet state here. There is no obvious mapping of this thing to, to a collection of database tables. Uh, and so the, the purpose of these data types is... Um, I have a couple of operations on the wallet state, the state. I know what the data of the wallet state is, and then I have to map it into a sequence of operations that are insert and update. And then I can group them and I may get uh, some performance uh, benefits. But this is, this is, uh, this is about mapping, mapping the types, so to speak. Okay, are there more questions? We still have a little bit of time. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's the fun the topic of, of SQL, maybe not representing the data that you want. This is a bit like asset state, right? Like asset state, uh, I suspect you're familiar, um, does the sort of write ahead log in a very specific way, right? So it's a function from, from your state to your state, um, but it might have some parameters. Um, and so your double encoding is just the name of that function plus the argument, right? So that's kind of a, a nice yes. thing to get used to the views of the system. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point of bringing up ACID state. So it's a Haskell library, uh, which uh, is slightly related. The idea is that you have a state of memory and it gets checkpointed to this periodically and then uh, uh, atomic. So ACID means atomic, consistent, forgot the other two. Uh, Way now, I've briefly looked. Or I uh, I have looked at the library. I think what it does at some point when checkpointing, it writes the entirety of the state. So one difference from from this approach to to ACID is, um, as it gives you most of the stuff for free, or you use template Haskell and you put in the type and it does all the things. And here you have a bit more flexibility on what data you specifically want. And you also have a little bit of flexi flexibility on how it operates. Um, so asset state uh, checkpoints the entirety of the state at certain intervals. You can thin them out, then you will gain some performance, but uh, it will, if the state is large, it, it's not able to, to uh, just write small things, at least as far as I understood from the head documentation. Yeah. 